I'm Corey Gunlock, Curator of African Arts at the Stanley Museum. At our previous events, panelists joined me to rethink the canon of African art and to explore new directions in artistic practice and performance. Tonight, our panelists, Vanetta Jules Rosette, J.R. Osborne, and Peju Layuola, will share their research that compels us to think critically about the museum and the ways in which it engages African art as a powerful resource embedded in the politics of identity and cultural heritage authenticity and representation, colonial history and social justice, and the ways in which African art appears at the forefront of a global movement towards a new relational ethics. Quote, it is important to remember, write Jules Rosette and Osborne, that public museums are political spaces and cultural engagement with them is a political act that can save human lives and heritage, end quote. While it may not be common to think of the museum as an institutional space in which to sanction life and death, it is certainly one in which the representation of life and death, whether in reference to individuals, communities, or ideas, has significantly shaped the public perception of history, truth, power, and diversity. As Western museums around the world today continue to reconcile with colonial history and complicity, either directly or indirectly, Social, ju social justice arises as an answer and an intervention in the museum. Social justice recognizes the limitations of inalienability surrounding the state ownership of looted objects and war. And it denies the political neutrality of third party agents, such as American art museums, involved in the marketplace for objects originating from colonial contexts in Africa. As a pedagogical method, Social justice also reveals the limitations of disciplinary practice and an art historical methodology offered by the late Africanist art historian Roy Sieber, the first in the world to earn a PhD in African art history at the University of Iowa in 1957, writes that as an art historian, you start with the work of art, you end with the work of art, but you go anywhere in between. Sieber's object-centered approach is critical to the field of African art studies because it positions museum collections as a central resource for teaching and learning. The political climate surrounding African art collections in American and European museums today, however, has less to do with the objecthood of our research and more to do with ethics, agency, and voice. Who begins with the object? Who ultimately ends up with it? And why does it undertake the journey in between? And for whom does this journey serve? In other words, who is telling the story and writing the history of African art? In response to these concerns, the importance of diversity and collaborative research on African art becomes paramount. And it is why this series features panelists working among diverse fields of African art studies in the US and in Nigeria, from which a significant percentage of objects in the African collection at the Stanley Museum originate, including examples from the Royal Court of Benin, that La Iwola will discuss this evening. And it is in this context for the title of tonight's event, Museum Interventions, that also applies broadly to the general goal of this series, in which panelists engage critically with the political stakes involved in ethics, representation, and the production of knowledge surrounding African art inside and beyond the museum. While tonight is the last of our Pasala events this fall, I present it to you tonight as a fresh step toward new directions in African art at the Stanley Museum, where social justice, critical analysis, and collaborative research will remain key to ensuring its contemporary relevance and its social and educational value as a public institution in Iowa. Presentations this evening begin with Bonetta Jules Rosette, followed by J.R. Osborne, and will conclude with Peju Laiwola. Afterwards, the panelists will join me for a 15 minute roundtable discussion followed by another 15 minute session with you, our audience. Please note that questions and comments for the panelists will be drawn from the Q&A box only. So now we'll turn our attention to Bonetta Jules Rosette and I'll introduce you. Bonetta Jules Rosette is a distinguished professor of sociology and the director of the African and African American Studies Research Center at the University of California, San Diego. Her areas of interest include contemporary sociological theory, and semiotic studies of religious discourse, tourism, and African art and literature. Her most recent books include Black Paris, 
the icon and the image and African art reframed reflections and dialogues on museum culture co-authored with our other panelists this evening, J.R. Osborne. Along with J.R., she is also the co-chair of graduate and undergraduate essay awards for the Association for Africanist Anthropology. Via Zoom on Tuesday, November 30th at 2.30 Pacific Standard Time, she will provide opening remarks for the African and African American Studies Research Center's commemoration, celebrating the life of Josephine Baker and the installation of her memorial plaque in the Paris Pantheon. I hand it over to you, Vanetta. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Corey, and thank you for having this um, interdisciplinary Pasala series. Uh, I'm very glad that it is interdisciplinary because the field of sociology does not have a great deal of specialist in art, exceptions being the late Pierre Bourdieu in France, Vera Zolberg uh, in New York. So I'm happy to join among those sociologists. Um, tonight, JR and I will do a joint um, presentation of uh, our book. So JR, can you please show or share the slides? Okay. Uh, we are going to include uh, the Stanley Museum in our both of our discussions, uh, and I'll explain how and why as we move along. Uh, next slide. Um, our book is available on a special discount from the University of Illinois Press, uh, which means that it is student affordable. I know a lot of people this evening have probably already have it or have seen and perused it. So a uh, brief commercial break. Okay, next slide. Um, we studied uh, 38 museums of African and African diasporic art on four continents, the United States, Europe, Africa, and part of the Middle East. Uh, JR, who's also a specialist in Middle Eastern studies, covered the Middle Eastern part. Uh, in terms of Africa, we did um, interviews primarily in Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, some small work in South Africa. And I had previously done research in West Africa and Cote d'Ivoire, but um, we did not uh, include a lot of that. Well, we did include some of that in the artist chapter. So we looked at each institution in terms of what we call transformational museum nodes. I want to make clear what this idea is so that people do not see this as a linear or historical approach. Um, we used a, a sociosemiotic approach to museums uh, based on theories by semioticians A.J. Grimas and Roland Bart. And they involve what's called a staggered semiotic system. That is, that uh, every institution or even type of art or fashion can be looked at as a semiotic system um, with different components. And those different components are often viewed as staggered or contrasting. So here, here we are with the five nodes. Thank you, JR. Node one is the curiosity cabinet. Now by that, we do not mean the German Wunderkammer, uh, the historical uh, cabinet of curiosities, although that would also fit here. Uh, many people have asked us, are you, are you looking at um, Renaissance curiosity cabinets? And we do look at some older ones and we'll be showing you some photos. Um, the curiosity cabinet node has a particular type of content, items chosen by taste. They can be artistic. There are also things like weapons, trinkets, things such as uh, um, are in a variety of mixed collections. Um, the 
people involved in building curiosity cabinets are individual collectors, curiosity seekers, and aficionados. And uh, the mix of objects is uh, often idiosyncratic. The second node uh, of museums, now what these nodes are, by the way, let me say very briefly, is um, they're based on grounded interviews, ethnographic research, and uh, visits to the museum spaces. So these are empirical categories, uh, which we then have organized into ideal semiotic types for purposes of analysis. Note two is the gallery space. Uh, that space then begins to break away from the uh, cab curiosity cabinet. Items are still chosen by a taste, but often classified aesthetically. Again, we have collectors, aficionados, artists, and a larger public. Some galleries are private and commercial concerns. Other galleries are public. Uh, note three are large edifice museums. Note three includes national museums, but is not limited to national museums. So here, um, uh, and I, I will say something about note two again in a minute, but here we will include the Smithsonian uh, Museum, the National Museum of Zimbabwe. These are museums that were in our sample that are large national museums, the entire Smithsonian complex, for example. These museums are open to the general public, uh, artists, aficionados, number of African museums, and some are at different phases now, so we could put the National Museum of Kenya in a node three position. These museums tend to have canonical exhibits, multiple collections, sometimes thematic exhibits, very structured displays. Returning briefly to node two, uh, it's not only are we placing gallery spaces in there, but based on our interviews, with university museums, such as the Fowler at UCLA, we would place university museums in high level of node two. Uh, Mara LeBruns, director of the Fowler, uh, gave us the classification node 2.75. So um, we would include um, university museums there. And of course, there are a, a, a wide range of university museums and archives. Uh, you know, that could be discussed. Um, node four includes postmodern museums. These are museums that have been built relatively recently. They have been built during the post-colonial period. They usually have um, very uh, well-known architects such as Jean Nouvel, um, David Adai, big architectural companies, they're often glass appearance museums, and you can see they, they pull on the entire general public. Um, and uh, they are often very hard to get into now that the pandemic is ending. They're often quite long lines to get into these museums. Note five are virtual assemblages and online displays. So let's go and look at some of these very briefly so that you can get a sense. Uh, the Hampton University Museum started in 1905 with the collection of William Shepard, uh, illustrates a classical uh, curiosity cabinet. Shepard was uh, a missionary and sort of self-taught uh, collector in Congo uh, during the turn of the century and uh, as one of the first African Americans to visit Central Africa, he brought back uh, many objects. And this is a picture of what his uh, curiosity cabinet looked like. Next. Uh, at the uh, uh, Neuchâtel Museum in Switzerland, again, we're dealing with about 1900 to 1905. Here's another example of a curiosity cabinet. So you can see a random collection of adzes, uh, carved ivory, various things, uh, very little signage uh, based on uh, taste and uh, uh, collectors. 
Next. Uh, curiosity cabinets, however, are not temporally um, structured. So this is uh, what's called the African Museum, Casa del Remoro in San Diego. This photo was taken in 2015, but this museum is alive, well, and still growing. But you can see its um, owner, Dr. Chuck Amber, sitting in front, and you have a sense of what his cabinet looks like, very similar to uh, the uh, two other curiosity cabinets that we've seen. Uh, his space contains four rooms. Uh, he says that he has 7,000 uh, volumes uh, of books. Uh, they're not all on site and about 5,000 objects, as well as several African animals, including a boa constrictor and a parrot um, that says uh, hello in Swahili. So anyway, we, <laughs> all of these things. Are next. Uh, the Musée d'Appel, uh, which was uh, founded during the 1960s in Paris uh, and has uh, recently closed and become an online exhibit space. This is the way the Dapper looked in 2006 when they had expanded to a second building. The Dapper uh, was housed in what's called a hotel particulier in France or a kind of an up end uh, um, small, we could say small castle to which they built uh, an addition uh, with a theater. The theater is behind this walkway that you see, and a cafe, a bookstore, a number of other things. Um, the Dapper is based on uh, private collections. And uh, let me just say briefly a little bit about that so that. Um, uh, the Dapper, which was first located near the Arc de Triomphe at 58 Rue Victor Hugo, opened in 1989 um, with uh, private collections drawn from uh, Switzerland, uh, probably African collections drawn from many countries, but from um, Christiane Falgueretz Laveau and her husband's collections. The Dapper did not have much of a standing collection of its own. Most of its exhibits were um, seasonal with borrowed objects. Uh, however, it had a very big international draw. OK, next slide. Um, in category two, we placed uh, the Fowler Museum at UCLA, uh, founded I'm um, going from memory, I believe in 1968. Uh, and we spent a great deal of time interviewing its director, Marla Burns, um, looking at its collection, attending exhibits, and also uh, spending time in the storeroom. Uh, Marla herself used Node 2.575 to classify the Fowler. Now, the Fowler also has many off site. Uh, stored items. The Fowler covers not only African art, but also some oceanic art and a great deal of Native American art. The Fowler has Native American artifacts, and also it had some human remains which have been already restituted and are being restituted and repatriated now. Okay. That's a, a very, I'm going to be very quick on these summaries, and people want more detail can go to the next. Uh, we have not interviewed Corey and Derek and the staff. So uh, we looked at the 50th anniversary building. And we, here is the new building for the Stanley um, projected to open in 2022. Corey did point out to us that according to our nodal paradigm, while we see the outside of the new Stanley, that there are many, many innovations that will put Stanley at nodes four and five. So please don't uh, take uh, 
we have not conducted our study and we hope that Corey will invite us to spend some time and actually apply the nodal framework to the new Stanley in 2022. Uh, next slide. Uh, node three uh, is uh, national museums. And here we have the National Museum of African Art, which started as about a note 1.5 to 2 in the Frederick Douglass home um, that was opened by Warren Robbins. And then uh, in 1987, a new spot was given to it by congressional mandate on the DC Mall. And it is now part of the larger Smithsonian complex. So it rates at 3.0. Um, there are a number of innovations that could be made. It has a, a large and um, air cooled storage area. It has three floors. It's able to do uh, two of the floors are uh, in subterranean, I guess you could say. Um, and it has uh, meeting rooms and uh, auditorium, etc. And a large collection. I don't know off the top of my head how many objects, including the Disney uh, Tishman collection, which has been central to its uh, collection base in African art. Next. Uh, the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, opened in 1937, is a classical Node 3 museum. Um, previously, part of the Musée du Trocadero, the Musée de l'Homme changed its venue and its collection patterns in the 1930s under the then dynamic museum directors, Paul Rivet and Georges-Henri Rivière. Um, the museum closed for a while in 2003 and its cultural, um, African cultural collections were transferred first to the Louvre Pavillon de Session and then to the Musée du Quai Branly. Next slide. Uh, the um, acquisition intake sheet developed by Georges-Henri Riviere was among the first to um, standardize storage and admission of objects. This is called the Feuille d'identification or identification paper for objects. Here you can see it more in a more close up. Each piece was categorized where it came from who collected it, its mode of acquisition, its conditions upon being um, acquired or donated. Uh, the piece was photographed uh, often from several angles. Um, and then the categories of ethnic and cultural origin and uh, original utilization of the piece were listed. Now, of course, and we all know that human remains were also in the Musée de l'Homme at that time, the most notorious human remains being those of Sarah Bartman, the hot and tot Venus um, that had been studied since uh, the 1880s in the original Musée de Trocadero, but her remains rested in the Musée de l'Homme um, until 2002, Nelson Mandela called for her remains to be returned in 1995, but it took several years. So this way the identification does not have a space to identify things like Sarah Bartman. It is more geared toward uh, actual objects. Some objects were obtained by sale, barter, at gifts, and there were other objects that we could put in the more gray category of having been um, looted or appropriated uh, in such a way that they need to be restituted. Next. Um, so when we then talk about these different museums, we need to talk about storage because we need to talk about what is there to be restituted and can we classify storage spaces in terms of the five nodes. So you can see them here. I'm just going to go over them very quickly. Curiosity cabinet is blended storage, gallery two space, and also many um, university museums have 
off-site storage or secluded storage rooms that were closed for public display but open to special visitors for university museums, for example, scholars and students can often go in. Large edifice node three museums usually have a dedicated storage space within the museum as well as outside spaces, but these spaces are open primarily to credentialed mu museum personnel, sometimes researchers, but mostly curators, um, officially vetted curators. Um, node 4 museums start to now include, and some node 3 ones do, but we put this more in node 4, visible storage. That is, storerooms, or what I would say is simulations of storerooms, are open to the public, um, and people can view what is in storage. Usually these are exhibits made to look like storage spaces. Uh, they're not the actual storage, and many of you who are curators are dealing now or have dealt with visible storage. Node 5 museums have blended storage. Stored actual items can be accessed online in controlled displays. Access to these virtual assemblages is password controlled. And uh, we must say that in Node 5, we often find galleries that are working for sale as well, so that access is not only password controlled, but these galleries are selling and circulating objects that move from the gallery into auction spaces back to collectors and so forth. Um, and the, following all of this would uh, be too much to cover this evening, but this gives you uh, an overview. Next slide. Uh, so having taken into account storage, then when the Musée de l'Homme was deconstructed in 2003, uh, all of its cultural objects, African cultural objects, were moved eventually to the Musée du Quai Branly. And this LP is a moving company, museum moving company in Paris. I think it's Livraison Parisien. And they um, wrap up the objects uh, in uh, delicately and then move them. Those objects that will become restituted in the future physically uh, may also be dealt with in a similar way. Uh, we have a record of some 300 objects that were um, moved out of a total of what's estimated to be 5,000 from the Musée de l'Homme. Uh, here's a comparison of how these objects looked at the Musée de l'Homme and how they looked at Quai Bon I want to thank J.R. Osborne for taking uh, these photos. Uh, so at the Musée de l'Homme, well, Serge Cholnet took one and J.R. Osborne took the second one. Uh, at the Musée de l'Homme, the objects were labeled following um, Riviere's identification piece, and each object had some sort of marking. So you can see that in, in the picture. We have a, a, a Luba um, sort of stool. We have uh, uh, some West African pieces. Many of you recognize these various pieces that are classical African art. And then we have uh, over in um, the slide on the right side, we see a Dogon mask. Uh, we see some other West African pieces. Corey can jump in and tell us what some of these are. We actually see three Dogon masks. None of these items uh, is identified by on the wall signage. There's a little plaque. And then as you go through, uh, if you have your cell phone or you've purchased a little walkie talkie for rent, then you can find out which each piece is. But this is what we call the cave on the effect is not to interrupt displays with a lot of signage. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is outside of the Quai Branly, so you can see how it is constructed and why we consider it a postmodern uh, architectural feat, uh, regardless of the fact that the actual objects inside 
are the same objects that were in a Node 3 museum. This must be taken into account. Those little boxes are little um, uh, display areas that John Nouvelle designed that you can walk into. There's Siberian art in one, and you have a certain kind of atmosphere uh, in these different display areas. This is an early photo uh, before the whole vegetable wall had grown. You can see what the vegetable wall kind of turned into later. The idea was to create this sort of tropical feeling in the middle of Paris, yet in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. Next slide. Uh, also in the shadow of the Washington Monument, we have the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened in 2016 uh, during the end of the Obama administration, but it had been in planning for many, many years. Uh, designed by David Ajayi and Company. Um, this has a filigree, um, sort of copper filigree that was based on, I believe, and Paige, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Nigerian designs. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, open space where you can see through the windows. Uh, there's a large multicultural cafeteria, a number of things, and several auditoriums. We have another uh, talk where we actually show this museum being built and we take you on a tour of it, but that's not for this evening. Okay, next slide. Uh, the Musée des Civilisations Noires uh, opened in 2018 in Dakar, Senegal. We classify it as a node for postmodern African museum. Again, you can see the design architecture. Um, we, uh, a close friend of mine is the vice president of outreach for this museum, but uh, JR and I did not include this one in our original sample because we were largely done with our research by the time this museum actually opened on the ground. So we look forward to going there right after we visit the Stanley. Okay, next slide. Uh, these are virtual con uh, collections. African digital art is an online um, reservoir that uh, has virtual collections of various artists. It's established by two Kenyan artists, or one Kenyan artist and one artist from Chicago. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, let's move on quickly now. I spent a lot of time on the nodes, and I want to talk about restitution. So based on what, uh, well, let's say something about curatorial networks, and I'm going to talk about restitution and wrap up. Curatorial networks occupy a second part of our book, and we attempted here, if you can bring the whole slide in, yeah, to bring, again, University of Iowa into our networks. Uh, so uh, Mary Polly Neuter Roberts, um, was uh, at the University of Iowa and was the mentor of Karen Melbourne, one of our central and key uh, informants at the uh, Smithsonian National Museum. And Karen followed uh, Polly to Iowa and uh, wrote her uh, dissertation on uh, Zambian art under Polly's supervision. Also closely working with the two of them is Marla Burns, who I've mentioned several times. And um, Karen and Marla were together on uh, putting up the Striking Iron exhibit, which Alan Roberts also mentioned in his uh, talk. All of this, our, our curatorial networks are much larger than this, but this is a slice to show you how many curators know each other, have been mentored by each other, and work with each other. So uh, we see uh, curatorial precedents, um, and I'm not going to read all of these. You can read them yourself, but as we move from Node 1 to Node 2 universities, where many of this that many of these curatorial precedents are incubated to most postmodern museums and uh, online. Now, postmodern museums, those in Europe, have a different 
kind of curatorial pattern because there are administrative schools such as the Ecole Publique d'Administration in France that train people to head these postmodern museums. And note five, um, collections are much more autonomous. They're often started by artists themselves. Okay, uh, next slide. I'm going to end by talking about restitution, uh, and this will be very short so that I can wind up more or less on time. Um, now, restitution and repatriation of art has become uh, a major um, and most important and central um, thrust in many museums. And we are asking the questions of why do museums of African art and um, ethnography often keep objects shrouded invisibly? And what kinds of transparency and accountability do we have? Um, return of uh, classical pieces from large Note three museums is one of the big pushes at this moment. Uh, some university museums are also uh, cataloging and restituting objects. Um, postmodern museums overlap in their collections often with uh, Note three. So I won't elaborate there. And I'm sure that Peju will talk a little bit about the Benin1897.com a digital Benin project. Node 5 um, uh, will become increasingly important as objects become restituted and we attempt to restore, archive, and keep a record of things that are actually returned. Next slide. Uh, there is Sarah Bartman's a headstone when her remains were returned from the Musée de l'Homme to Gatmos Valley near Cape Town in South Africa. And a special ceremony was had to install her. Next slide. Uh, Josephine Baker equally uh, will be honored, as um, Corey mentioned, at the Pantheon on November 30th. Um, Josephine, who is a French citizen by adoption, was buried actually twice before, but will not be moved from her second burial place in Monaco, where she's buried with her husband, Joe Bouillon. Um, this is a very, again, interesting aside, which I will not go into, but this is a case in which the French government, rather than an African country, is repatriating its own citizen who happens to be of African-American origin. So again, here's a breakdown of all your expected categories. A black repatriated person to France who is not going to be repatriated. Next. Uh, very quickly, I do not have time, Corey has told me to go into this, but people are also being restituted. So there is now work on the Rastafarians who have gone from Jamaica to Ethiopia. They started remigrating to Africa as early as um, 1966 when Haley Selassie gave them the silver medal of Ethiopia for being um, patriotic returnees, even though most of them had no uh, genetic connection to Ethiopia. However, um, uh, there are now several scholars, in particular Julia, Julia Abonacci in Paris, who are looking at uh, Rastafari restitution. The Rastafarians themselves call their movement restitution. Uh, the MOVE uh, uh, movement in Philadelphia, uh, its children are now, re children's remains, three of them at least, are now being restituted to their families. Um, this was a social and religious movement founded by um, Vincent Lepart, also known as John Africa, and everyone in the movement has the last name of Africa. Uh, and they are now protesting along with Black Lives Matter to have their children restituted to their families. Uh, third restitution. Next slide is me. Um, 
I have not been thoroughly restituted, but I'm saying I have here. So a photo of my family is now in front of my former family home on what's called the Blooming Dale Heritage Tra uh, Trail in Ledroit Park, Washington, DC. There's the original family photo, which is part of my collection uh, with my aunts and uncles and myself, I'm the little one in the middle eating before everyone else. And there's the same photo now on the street detailing the heritage of our family. The Bloomingdale Heritage Trail was something that was also supported by a Smithsonian outreach project. Um, last slide, I believe. Okay, uh, in our book, we have nine uh, steps for building exchanges and making change. Uh, you can see them here. J.R. Osborne will reprise some of them. Most important are creating transparency and curatorial networks, expanding South-North connections and exchanges, um, linking public and private sectors, and opening up uh, new learning strategies, which are now be call being called remediation for presenting the objects that exist. Um, these, we could have a whole symposium just on these strategies. JR will reprise them in terms of design and technology. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate, Corey, that you've had me here. Thank you so much, Vanetta. For in fact, there's a closing slide that said the end and thank you, but. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Thank you so much, Benetta, for that insightful presentation on nodal analysis and how it uh, informs these ideas on restitution. Um, just for the record, I do remember asking you about the criteria for assigning the Stanley Museum to node 2.75, but I did not suggest or promise anything within the four or five category. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and I, I look forward to hearing more about this in our group discussion. Okay. Um, I'd like to turn our attention now to our next speaker, J.R. Osborne. Um, J.R. is a scholar and experimentalist of communication. His work explores media, history, semiotics, communication technologies, visual culture, and design aesthetics with a regional focus on the Middle East and Africa. Dr. Osborne is currently an associate professor of communication, culture, and technology, and co-director of the Technology Design Studio, TDS, at Georgetown University, where he guides students through design strategies that result in media and museum interventions. Dr. Osborne's book, Letters of Light, Arabic Script in Calligraphy, Print, and Digital Design, won the 2018 British Kuwait Friendship Society Book Prize and received an honorable mention for the 2018 Albert Vorani Book Award for, from the Middle East Studies Association. The book follows the story of Arabic scripts and technology from the advent of calligraphic tradition through the implementation of the Unicode standard. In 2012, Dr. Osborne produced, co-directed, and edited the feature-length documentary film Glitter Dust, Finding Art in Dubai, which examines the burgeoning contemporary art scene in the United Arab Emirates. Most recently, he co-authored African Art Reframed, Dialogues and Reflections on Museum Culture, which Benetta just shared with us. And this book analyzes the global circulation of African art, as we've learned, drawing upon extensive curatorial interviews, ethnographic site visits, uh, the visual and digital analysis of artworks, quote unquote, digital unmixing, which JR will be speaking about shortly, and studies of audience response. And as mentioned before, professors Jules Rosette and Osborne also serve as co-chairs of the Student Paper Awards Committee for the Association for Africanist Anthropology. Please join me in welcoming J.R. Osborne. Over to you, J.R. Excellent, thank you uh, very much, Corey. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you, Benetta, and thank you, uh, Peju, as well. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion um, after the presentation. Um, and I, so I will be building off what uh, Benetta presented our, the, of our research and one of our interventions, which we've called unmixing. Uh, 
And this is also outlined in our, our book. So again, the brief um, uh, plug there with the, with the code that it's uh, available for 40% off with that, with, that dis with that discount. And to begin my presentation, I'll, I'll go back to the quote that Corey began with from Roy Sieber, since we are here in Iowa, at least virtually. As an art historian, you start with a work of art, you end with the work of art, but you can go anywhere in between. And I'd like to pair that quote with a quote from Simon Jami, who we interviewed for our book. It is through the works and the works alone that the answers will transpire, or at least the routes toward renewed reflection. This is a uh, quote from Simone's um, introduction to African or Africa Remix, which was an inspire of our own unmixing project. So we wanna be in dialogue with the works, speaking through the works, but also pairing that with experiments in remediating and re-examining, representing the works. So with those quotes I'm building here off Ross Perry, especially from his book, Recoding the Museum, where he quote says, quote, in an electronic polyvalent culture, objects are in a state of motion and may occur or migrate through many different states and different media. So Ross Perry's one influence, as well as uh, Clementine Delis, who has the quote, to remediate means, to bring about a change of medium, to experiment with other ways of describing, interpreting, and displaying the objects in the collection. And Delis gives a number of examples of this in her uh, recent uh, uh, book, uh, The Metabolic Museum, and she calls it, um, talks about making the museum into a laboratory. She has the model of the museum university. And so what on mixing is one of these experiments in a different way of trying to describe or interpret and display objects. So what is on mixing? This is from our, our book, um, from Benetta's in my book. On mixing entails the location and the separation of semiotic and aesthetic elements that compose an artwork to enable in-depth analysis, curatorial contextualization, and artistic reconfiguration. It enables these practices of curatorial contextualization, artistic interpretation, audience perception, and community dialogue. And in this presentation, I really wanna focus on these two, curatorial contextualization of the artworks that are unmixed, and then how that might inspire more community dialogue. So what do we mean by, by this? How do we take this into account? So begin with a, one example. This is from uh, Bogomil Jusewicki, the art historian. And this is a uh, hit from his essay, Painting in Zaire, which appeared in the Africa Explorers catalog. And he's describing popular um, Zaire and Congolese painting. And he says, a Zairean painting refers to a story and emits a narrative even when the story is not explicitly represented in the picture space. As no sequence is imposed among the images, the viewer must create one, adjusting it to suit the meaning they give to each element. It is possible to twist these meanings, to contrast them with variants, and thus to observe them in a temporal dimension of one's own. So in unmixing, we have attempt to do this, to, to make this an active, experience, an interactive experience, where one can compare variants, twist the meanings, observe them in temporal dimension of their own. So let me demonstrate what we mean by that. Um, I'll bring this up. Here is our um, unmixing interface. Here is a painting by uh, Sherry Samba, the type of painting that, that Jusuwiki is discussing, and it has various elements. In this unmix, we have chosen the elements that highlight modernity, in this painting, um, and you can remove and unmix them out of the painting. We can remove the buildings, samba, self, the cars, the language, and then you can bring them back in to choose the variants in a time of one's own and always go back to the original artwork. In this case, we also animated the cars to further emphasize that curatorial idea of showing how modernity and change is represented in this painting. So the curatorial contextualization is choosing which of these elements can be removed within the frame and which of them can be removed, isolated, brought back in to make variants without necessarily remixing it with another 
with another piece, keeping the artwork itself con consistent. So really quick um, to show unmixing as a method, it has a few steps, seven steps that we outline in, in our, our chapter six of our book. Um, these are not, um, I won't go into all of them, but they involve locating those key semiotic elements based on what the curators wish to emphasize in a specific exhibit. The curatorial contextualization chooses those elements then being able to isolate them in the artwork and reconfiguring them in a way that as I showed was interactive. Then once uh, gallery visitors are able to interact with these, these uh, workstations, they're able to have discussions through the artworks and through one another based upon their variants. When we installed these and did some tests, um, we've done tests uh, both at UC San Diego, we presented it um, to the National Museum of African Art, and I also did a test in the, um, in the National Postal Museum of the Smithsonian. One of the things that was most amazing was that view viewers who did not arrive together would stop and speak about the artworks on display by making their own preferred unmixing and talking to each other about why they preferred some elements and not the others. Uh, in this uh, talk, I also wish to talk a little bit about the precursors of unmixing um, as, as it relates to earlier models of museology. Um, here is one of our precursors of uh, the photography of Elliot Elosophon, who says, quote, to better explain the plastic quality of works of African sculpture, I began in 1951 to photograph them in such a manner that only one aspect of an object would be isolated for critical observation. I did this because few uh, people are capable of seeing only one part of a piece at a time and building from the part to the whole. Unmixing very similarly is trying to do this building of a part from a whole so that when a viewer goes from the digital terminal back towards the object on display can understand how the pieces interact. Another example from our interview with um, Serge Ternay, who Benetta mentioned, um, when the Fon War God Gu, the statue of Gu was moved um, from the, um, the Musée de Lome, here it's shown in, in the, the Musée de Trocadero, prior to the Musée de Lome, when it was moved from the Musée de Lome to the Quai Branly, Joseph Adande and Serge Ternay had a au revoir dear Gu celebration where they took Gu and they unmixed each of the various elements that are part of Gu's costume, the, the tools, the, the weaponry, the various parts of the, of the statue, and they unmixed them and showed the, the, explained the significance of each element. And so we could imagine an unmixing kind of interface or activity where these become either costumes or even kind of make your own Gu action figures once these elements are understood. <laughs> a third example here um, in an earlier presentation, Benetta and I worked uh, with the uh, Mesa College um, collections in uh, Mesa College in San Diego. Uh, we looked at uh, this uh, Bundu mask um, and Bundu masks when that we talk about, for example, stylistic features. Um, here's the, the photography inspired by Lassifin to show the different parts of it, but also elements are isolated. The, significance of the eyes, the small mouth, the ears, uh, the rolls of fat, these stylistic elements are pulled out. And once we have identified or unmixed those from the works of art kind of curatorially or contextually through, um, through an, an research and, and visual analysis, then we can take those elements with uh, visitors and compare them, for example, here in con a contemporary work of art inspired by these masks to show that elements are there as well, the scarification, up reappears, these rolls uh, appear as well underneath the mask, and even using digital tools then to juxtapose these contemporary modes with what they look like with the uh, traditional modes so that audiences can see the change that has happened of works that are inspired uh, from the traditional and how that has inspired new works or what Kevin T. DeLise would call new ways of knowing. We could imagine a similar type of um, process being done with this, this mask from the Stanley collection. Um, Sylvester Ovechi in his presentation mentioned this mask and discussed how the object on display did not present the entire object and it denies the history of the object before the collection by not knowing or not identifying who made the mask. Yet the description on the Stanley site also points out a lot of the stylistic elements, the three layers, 
and point and then what they signify and what they mean. So we could uh, have a similar process where those elements are then unmixed to build from the parts to the whole in a way not to um, specifically as um, to reclaim the lost history, which we um, which which may be um, may be lost to us now, but then in, to make the object itself display itself that we can enter into dialogue with the object um, and the, the presentation will present the object as a way of inspiring new understandings of it, new configurations, and perhaps new artworks and new visual traditions. So with that, to return to these quotes that we began, as an art historian, you start with the work of art, you end with the work of art, and you can go anywhere in between. Unmixing is part of this anywhere in between. Um, in, a, in a gallery setting, in a museum setting, the, the work of art will remain on display. The unmixing digital station is there and it becomes a guided interaction where audiences can select, remove, look at the elements in their own light, figure out how variants, um, variants um, operate to get a deeper understanding of it. But when they look back at the art, when they return, they end with the work of art, the work of art as it is presented on, and in, its, in its totality is still there on, the, on display. And it is through those interaction with those works that new questions will arise. And so not only can we say that we're hoping to dialogue with the works, but then even take it perhaps if we're brave one step further and to dance with them. And with this, uh, Bennett and I are inspired by a visual anthropologist and experimental filmmaker, Trin Min Ha, who um, has this quote that I do not intend to speak about, just speak nearby. And I would say that museums often had, for historically many museums attempt to speak about their artworks. And as we're becoming more reflexive and getting more voices and multiple voices about the objects, we're starting to learn to speak nearby. And on, on mixing asks is if in addition to speaking nearby, we can enter in and begin to speak with some of the visual elements or at least interact with the elements to not only speak nearby, but to speak with the works of art, or again, to quote Simone Jami, to dance with them. In our, when we interviewed Simone, he had this wonderful quote saying, when I'm making a show, I'm inviting people to a space. I'm inviting them to a dance. I know that the show is successful when people start to dance in that space. And so the dream that the visitors will not simply attend and view objects, but will be able to dance with them intellectually, curatorially, and interactively. This also parallels what many of the, the artists said in the second series of talks where they, um, they mentioned hoping the audience would slow down, look at their objects, interact with them uh, directly. And then to wrap up, I'll return to these nine points that Benetta um, had in her uh, presentation. Um, these, Von Mixing uh, specifically deals with the kind of the last three of them. It reconfigures archives and databases. Von Mixing will allow us to get new classifications and new connections based on audience interaction, observing the types of um, organizations that audience, audience and users choose, the types of things they like to unmix, the types that they unmix less, might lead us to new types of classification strategies. And in turn, that will inspire new new ways of learning and discussing and examining the artworks and connecting those artworks, not only with other artworks on display through how we might unmix similar elements, but also connecting them with the users themselves who get a deeper meaning of them and are able to connect those unmixed elements to their, um, to their, to their lives, both within and beyond the museum. So, Thank you very much. And as I said, I very much look forward to the discussion once the presentations have wrapped up. Thank you so much, JR. Um, I can't help but recognize the historical origins of this technique that you're discussing in terms of an unmixing, um, particularly with respect to the images you showed by Elliot Elisafin. And I'm thinking in particular of Franz Ulbrichs and his morpholo morphological approach to stylistic analysis that reaches way back into the 40s and in fact precedes Sieber's PhD. Um, I think one of the in interesting things to recognize is that Sieber oversaw 
the first PhDs in African art studies at Ghent before Sieber got his PhD at Iowa in 57, um, just from two different disciplinary perspectives, the anthropological studies of African art and then art historians such as Sieber in Iowa. And so there's so much historical depth to this technique and you're taking it to the next level digitally with a focus on contemporary work. And so I think it's um, quite fascinating to see that evolution and the fact that it's still relevant um, in the museum today. So thank you so much, JR. Really, yeah, just very quick comment. Yeah, thank you for those. Yeah, and I would agree with you that it's it's not so much as I think imagining, uh, it is imagining new directions for the museum, but not so much a departure as it is realizing that technologies and new technologies have always been part of the museum um, playbook to present works. And so it's building on those traditions and asking how can we use our current technologies to present things in, in novel ways. So yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, JR. Um, so now we'll turn our attention to our final speaker, Peju Laiwola. Um, Peju Laiwola is an artist and art historian. Her research, writing, and artistic engagements have consistently engaged themes of artifact pillage, restitution, history, memory, and the artistic trajectories of African, Africa, and diaspora artists. She has published several articles, both locally and internationally, some of which appear in notable journals and books such as Benin Kings and Rituals, Court Arts from Nigeria, The Open Arts Journal of the Open University, United Kingdom, Paradoxa International Feminist Art Journal, and Nka Journal of Contemporary African Art. Some of her solo exhibitions include Benin1897.com, Art and the Restitution Question, published in 2010, Who's Centenary from 2014, Returned from 2018, Indigo Reimagined in 2019. She's received several awards and grants which include the Lagos Studies Association Distinguished Scholars Award uh, 2021 this year, Tyson Scholar, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in 2019, Terra Foundation for American Art Grant 2018, and Distinguished Researchers Award Faculty of Arts, University of Lagos, 2007. Leawola is Professor of Art History, University of Lagos, the current President of the Arts Council of the African Studies Association, commonly known as ACASA, and a life member of the Lagos Studies Association and a member of the College Arts Association. She runs two art-led initiatives, a nonprofit, the Women and Youth Art Foundation, and master classes in Lagos, Nigeria. <clears throat> Excuse me, please join me in welcoming Peju Ayuola. Take it away, Peju. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Corey. Um, I'm honored to be speaking alongside Benetta and J.R. Osborne. I'm going to take off my video because I don't think my bandwidth can sustain this discussion. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I'll refer to some of my artistic um, projects and in doing so raised issues that relate to the concept of the museum of the museum in Africa, particularly looking at the Benin example. And here I refer to Benin City in the south of Nigeria, and this should not be confused with the country Benin, former Kingdom of Dahomey, which is a part of Prakunfun, uh, Africa. So um, Benin I refer to is the present day capital of Edo State. It was a historic West African kingdom ruled by an all powerful king, known as the Oba, and it was taken over as a British colony and is the home of the famed uh, Benin Bronzes. So I'll make reference to um, the solo exhibition uh, titled Benin1897.com Art and the Restitution Question, which was held in 2010, and it was the first exhibition in Nigeria to deal with the story of expropriated objects taken from Benin City in 1997 by British soldiers. So the .com or .commercial as in a domain name underlines the commercial aspect of the loot, the stripping of art and the co-modification of Benin objects sold first to cover the cost of the British expedition and later showing up as art auctions where they were acquired by private and public institutions across the globe. So the exhibition questions the ownership of Benin objects and the authority of Western museums over these items. 
This project was a way of reclaiming ancient and classical Benin art in what I refer to as art recording art or art speaking to art. And this uh, second intervention is a public art project whose centenary 2014. I invited the 10 other contemporary artists to participate in this iteration, which marked the centennial year of the passing of the exiled king of Benin, Obaburami. This was a counter reaction to the celebration of the amalgamation of the Southern and Northern Protectorate of Nigeria by the Nigerian state. And the third is the ongoing show, uh, exhibition titled Resist, the Art of Resistance at the RJ Museum in Cologne, where I was invited to curate the It's Yours Room, uh, which comprises about 94 looted Benin objects and the collection of the RJ Museum alongside the works of various contemporary artists and activists that have been involved in the clamor for the return of Benin objects. So under a subtitle, Ancestors as Objects, I refer to 1897.com, the title piece of the exhibition, which comprises about a thousand terracotta heads and speaks to the objectification of African art in Western museums and how these religious materials were reduced to mere objects and shown behind glass cases in the museum or kept tucked away in museums, museum storehouses. Well, the number of works looted uh, from the kingdom about between three to 4,000 pieces, although recently Dan Hicks uh, mentions the likelihood of about 10,000 pieces. And for several years, the renowned uh, writer on restitution matters, Kwame Okoku, has challenged Western museums to reveal the number of their holdings. Today, there's a remarkable change with the Digital Benin Project and the documentation of Benin objects in Western museums. Provenance research is also being carried out on various collections. So there's, there are discrepancies between what an object is and what that object represents. Oftentimes, the meaning of an object is redefined from outside the culture. Its identity is constructed and confined in categories defined by Western institutions and museums. For instance, the re recent uh, return of um, the, the Benin cock, Oporu which has a rich interpretation within the culture, is given another meaning far from what it was going to represent. The cock, which is an altarpiece kept in honor of the king or queen mother, uh, reflects hierarchies in a society through the materiality of the work. And so these brass works of cocks were kept on royal altars and uh, the wooden ones were you know, reserved for the altars of chiefs. And in this last, uh, or in this, uh, uh, last several decades of his life in the Jesus College, Cambridge, the cock has served as an appendage of the logo of the British College. There's also the Western concept of the museum transposed to museums in Africa. And so we see here West, the Western display of um, African art that gets the notion of how art is perceived and consumed in African societies. This takes us back to the perception of art and religious icons as mere objects and the Benin churches were largely used in ritual, religious rituals and kept on shrines. And although shrines can be likened to museums, the Western Museum Gallery does not have the ambience of the hallowed chambers of the shrine, which once held many of the looted cultural items. That is why a Congolese visitor to a Western Museum will cringe at the sight of an array of Nkisi Nkori uh, sculptures as I once witnessed in Europe. So Undibisum is a Lumba identifies two types of shrines, the royal and the non-royal shrines. And it refers to these shrines as mini museums that have been intentionally created for the collection, accumulation, and presentation of artifacts or artworks. It draws an analogy between the conventional museum and the shrine in the sense that just as museums ascension and the ascension uh, objects that are no longer relevant, shrines also neutralize some ritual objects that have served their ritual term. Shrines like museums, in a sense, establish the chronology of objects. And this is evident in the establishment of altars raised by a reigning king in honor of a past uh, king. And so there were several you know, of these altars where they had the memorial heads, also known as Umlau, which were present in the uh, king's palace. And so the British soldiers desecrated these altars by yanking up the memorial heads from their initial location. These altars were sites of memory where the history of the lineage was recounted and recited in veneration of past kings. So in this installation, you see the layout of the shrine and at the same time, the dispersal of 
the looted linen objects. There's also uh, conflicting ideas about how and where an object should be displayed. For a long time, some of the arguments against the restoration of Benin objects have been that there were no proper museums to house collections in Africa. And by extension, Africans were incapable of taking care of valuable, these valuable materials. So the 1976 request by the Nigerian state for the Benin Ivory Mask in the British Museum, which was declined, is a case in point. The idea that looted art should be kept in similar spaces as they have been in Europe and American institutions should not be. When the regalia of the exiled king of Bahamurame was handed over to Abba Kenzo II in 1937, it was a thing of joy for the reigning king. And these return items of regalia were not taken into any museum, but were assimilated into the sartorial traditions of the palace. And likewise, the brass gong and idiophone, which were restituted in 2014 by Adrian Walker, a grandson of one of the British soldiers, um, you know, and these, were, these works were returned in the palace of the king. And so we have um, the images here showing um, Adrian Walker returning um, the bronze uh, works. So palace rituals and relevant guilds associated with specific duties are still in operation, particularly the guild of casters who still make works, although for a new clientele. Brass works we, uh, were placed on the shrine or the throne of the king during the coronation ceremony in 2016. And this goes to show that Benin art is part of a living culture. It is not frozen in time and should be seen as a continuum. It is relevant today as in the past. And the photograph showing of Akenza II holding the um, return regalia is captured on the commemorative cloth designed by my mother, Princess Elizabeth Ulu, for her father's funeral in 1978. In the installation, Long Live the King, 113 gods were used to represent the years since the sack of the name. And each god had symbols associated with particular kings. For example, about her who was, um, was represented with uh, mud fish legs. And here we have the fabric design of the commemorative cloth uh, put on the god uh, in honor of Abakenza II, which is a new form of commemoration. So in looking at contemporary art and new curatorial projects in museums, I turn to Greer's, uh, Greer Valley's observation uh, about the emerging phenomenon where museum creators are looking for ways artists and activist scholars from Africa and African diaspora can, and in quotes, mine their museums and think of creative ways of dealing with their colonial history. The creation of the It's Yours Room is built on a long lasting, um, long lasting research interest and connection with the director of the ROJ Museum, Nanette Snoop, and her husband, Mela Mule, an anthropologist who invited me to participate in the Broken Memory Project in 2005, a project which explored what the loss of expropriated materials meant to the communities that produced them. And here I refer to the, uh, the Guild of Bronze Casters. So the It's Yours Room comprises works of contemporary artists relevant to the Benin story showing alongside 94 Benin objects which hopefully will be part of the over 1,000 pieces to be restored to Nigeria next year by Germany. So I was given the latitude to show uh, what I desired in this space. And so I chose this uh, artist who I've followed in the last several years. Uh, I've been working on the Benin story. So the collection at the ROJM comprises different object types in different media. Some of them acquired by the museum within two years of the expedition. Many of these looted arts have never been shown and only a few have been taken to all the exhibitions. Providence research is going on on this collection. This project has sparked up a body of work for me titled Ancestors by Number. And when objects uh, are, uh, are moved from one location to the other, they acquire different meanings. And in some cases they are reduced to numbers, numbers that are determined by collectors and dealers showing an inventory list, index cards, lots, numbers, at auctions, and other forms of numbering that mean nothing to those who produce them. This builds on an earlier work titled Columns of Memory, shown at the Boundary Object Exhibition in Kunstas Dresden in 2015, under the auspices of a Berlin-based activist group uh, called, known as Artifacts. So as the Berlin objects return, there should be a more fluid way of engaging with these tangible materials, so that this, those culturally related to the art will have a sense of connection too, and also have a sense of ownership of the arts. 
And in discussing museums, the museum culture in Ghana, Kwame Labi advocates for dialogue, engagement, and consultation with community leaders in carrying out museum projects. A model for this is the Host Centenary Project, uh, which was carried out in the host community of artists known as Igwemo, or the Guild of Brass Casters. Several meetings were held before the event and to get full participation, we employed creative ways in involving the metal casters. And we had quite a number of artists on the project who worked within the casters atelier without disrupting their day-to-day -day activities. Brass casters or the black, sorry, the brass works were taken off their foundries and used in performances like you find here with uh, Jalili Atiku, the renowned performance artist using some of the um, bronze cast for his performance. Um, here we find the bronze head in the middle of his uh, display uh, during the church service he held in Benin City. And Elizabeth Olu performing Wura Natasha Ogunji. Uh, processions that have moved from the Kenza quarters to the um, Ring Road uh, to the um, place where the casters actually live and work. And um, now, uh, we're out also performing along the streets of the main, sweeping the streets of the digitals of colonialism. Victor Kameno painting um, his work in the compound of the head of the Guild of Casters. So I was happy to take my 1897.com installation back to Benin, where it had, after it had been shown in Lagos and Ibadan, and to have the works shown in their own environment against the rustic walls of the palace of the head of the Guild rather than in a white cube and where anyone walking by can have direct engagement with the works. For me, the high point of this iteration was to invite the casters to put in their works within the installation. The collaboration between academically trained artists and artists schooled in the established Edo canons of representation brings to the fore the fluidity and dynamism of the tradition which is not fixed in the glorious past and the culture that is not static and one that has moved from the fixation of the pre-1897 or pre-1897. Uh, so the Edo casters are traditional, they can be referred to as traditional, they can be referred to neo-traditional and even contemporary. And so um, we look at Gagliardi and Biro's point about uh, the imperfections of these categories, traditional, classical, neo-traditional, historical, contemporary. And this category is actually blur in the face of current reality. So I'll conclude by showing one of the works um, by Wakusu Ejose, an artist that is shown in the Cologne exhibition, uh, the delicate drawings and superimposition of images of the main classical object of everyday scenes in the city, uh, showing that the past is very much a part of the present and the future. And as I mentioned earlier, Benin art should be viewed as a continuum. And the emphasis or the overemphasis on classical Benin arts uh, denies the appreciation of contemporary artistic expressions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peju, <clears throat> for that illuminating discussion of your work as an artist and curator and art historian. And um, I think I'd like to to turn the uh, the the table now and open up the conversation to a group discussion with all of our panelists. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, I'd like to begin with you, Peju, and talk a little bit more about um, your, your history of work on this topic in particular with restitution and, um, and how it relates to the current movement towards the digitization of these collections. Um, more broadly and spe well, specifically with digital Benin. And, um, you know, this comes up in, in multiple places as a strat strategy um, among practices of restitution and is mentioned in, in uh, Bonetta and JR's book um, and ways to move forward. And I'm curious about the ethics surrounding the digitization of these, these objects in terms of how they will end up being used right now um, you know, the Digital Benin Project is cataloging these objects and plans to show them in the new museum um, that should be opening by 2025. Um, can you talk a, a little bit more about your, your feelings about the way that these objects might be used in the future um, post-digitization, post-restitution? 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start by saying that I took part in a project in 2005, uh, which was, um, you know, I mentioned that uh, Bernard Mouli was actually the um, person behind this project. And what it meant was that we had to do some surveys um, at the Goon Street. Uh, we we're trying to find out what the loss of these objects meant to those who, um, you know, were the producers of, you know, the objects that were found that are in uh, Western museums. And a lot of the artists were talking about the fact that they really wanted to see this object, but they had no access to them. And so they resorted to looking at um, catalogs and uh, prints, uh, which were produced in many of these um, Western museums. And so that, that was their only way of uh, having access to the works of their predecessors. So I call those uh, artificial filters. Um, so I'd also think that um, even when the Nigerian um, government in 1976 requested for the beginning objects, uh, in the British Museum, the ivory mask um, to mark the first stack. Uh, I don't think the Nigerian was even aware that there were other masks uh, in that frame in other museums. So I think that in a sense, the digital building project, um, you know, um, is a welcome idea in the sense that people would, would not know where these works are. And I know that they are spread over more than 161 um, institutions across the globe um, or collections across the globe. Um, but so it's, it's very difficult to, um, you know, know where these works are. And I think that if they are cataloged and photographed and there's some form of uh, documentation done on them, then you can now tell how these works have traversed. But it's also the question of uh, who, the ownership of these this, uh, digital records. Who owns these records at the end of the day? Yes, we want to know where these works are. But at the same time, we are not sure how the materials are going to be used. And if these materials are going to be very, really accessible to those who think that, who own these objects and what value this, um, the digital materials will, will hold for those who are actually putting them together. So there's still a lot that is unclear about this. But I think in a sense, the welcome development that this um, cataloging is being done. And so we get to know who has what, who are those who are holding uh, the building objects in different parts of the globe. Thank you, Peju. Um, you know, I see the, the intersections between, you know, the ethical questions surrounding the digitiz digit digitization of these objects and the, the promise offered with these interventions through this method of unmixing, which re reaches back into Simone and Jami's, you know, recategorization of African art in his basically um, departure from conventional ways of presenting and displaying African art. Um, I'd like to hear more from Benetta and JR about this idea of ruptures in your nodal system in museums and what sort of people and, and ideas are responsible for making those ruptures. Um, you, you bring up the importance of artists, of course. And so um, in this way of, of conceiving um, this, this nodal system that drives your research, um, focusing on transparency and the way that museums work, um, I'd like to hear you talk more about this idea of ruptures and how it shapes um, your evolving presentation of this nodal system. Uh, well, let me start and then I'll let JR take it up because he's the digital expert. Um, uh, so uh, rupture often occurs, and I'm speaking now as a sociologist more than an art historian or a semiotician, rupture uh, often occurs by external social problems, right? So um, uh, museums lose funding, uh, kinds of approaches to museology really change. So if we roll things back to 1897 to 1900, like people were actually at colonial expositions in not so much cages, but little displays like human beings were. And all of that changed in the 20th century and, and actually the Riviere Reve um, kind of revolution that they did at the Musée de l'Homme after Picasso discovered his mask was it was a big revolution in terms of uh, classifying. I mean, Peju is really correct. It's a Western way of classifying objects, but there wasn't a clear classificatory system. So um, 
to, to answer your prompt, I've lost the direction of the whole question, but um, ruptures occur in many, many ways, and some are seismic and some are economic. Um, let's just take one example. Um, Leopold Senghor, when he became president of Senegal, devoted one third of Senegal's income budget to building a national museum, which actually came into being with the Musée de Civilisation, but he poured money into that as a national project. So uh, that was a seismic change in what artists in West Africa were doing, and especially in Senegal, but in, in that whole region, because it incorporated the region that you study, Mali, Burkina Faso, all of those artists were drawn into um, what was originally Singor's sort of negritudinist paradigm. So I think a lot of these changes occur externally to museums themselves. Um, but museums, I am very impressed in my interviews with curators at how adaptable, how smart, and how ready many museums are to collaborate. And I think Peju is in the middle of um, a lot of different sorts of backing and forcing interactions. Uh, JR is trying to bring these things out on a more digital level. Um, but, but I think it, we have to look at internal and external factors. That would be my answer to your question in a very general way. And that um, there's a lot of research for um, art historians, for our graduate students, for people worldwide to do as we uh, encounter these projects. They're going to be massive, really. JR, would you care to contribute? Yeah, I'd add that I think institutions at all sizes have, have ruptures, as Benetta said, if they lose funding or if they gain funding and they're trying to reimagine their kind of new directions or um, whether or not they're replacing staff with, um, um, you know, um, through digitization or, or losing staff in that sense. Um, so some ruptures I think are specific to institutions. There are also large um, ruptures that kind of shake up the, the museum world. Um, digital technology being one of them. Um, and that's one of the things I really um, appreciate in Ross Perry's work in recoding the museum. The question he's asking is about the compatibility or incompatibility of digital models of culture and museological models of culture. And of course, since that book has come out, there's been more and more interaction and there's been more of uh, the digital presence in our lives has, has increased, but um, I think we have to both embrace the possibilities of that of the digitization and, and what digital culture does, but also look at the limits of that in terms of what it means about objects, that the digitization of an object is not the object. And especially um, if we're pushing back at this notion of um, kind of Western epistemological classifications and the, uh, in, in museums and how, how objects have been classified from um, from a, a very Eurocentric standpoint based upon geography or, or region or, or collectors. Um, simply digitization is a rupture in that model and it replaces it with different classifications, but most of those digital database structures are themselves Western um, structures. Uh, so the challenge is really, as I think, as you pointed out, to take both these models of kind of models of digital models of classification and databases, the art historical models, but then also the third leg being, as you mentioned, the anthropological work, since anthropological studies are looking at alternative systems of classification, how those, 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 um, those classification systems intersect with different ideas of culture, of value, of, of historicity. historicity. And, and, and so I think those, um, the unmixing, is, is attempting to do that in kind of a specific, um, a specific mode. Uh, I think Peju's work is also doing that by reimagining the role of the museum and exhibits um, in this kind of post-digital age. And even the way that the Benin.1897.com has the .com at the end, even as a 
even though it's an installation exhibit and pushes back at that kind of limits of digitization and, and kind of that that it's that if that model itself could just kind of lead to the further commodification. And we so we really have to walk that line both between what those new technological models allow us to present and retaining the wealth of um, alternative strategies that museums have have preserved and their, their charges to share and to um, educate the public about. I, I just want to say one quick thing. Um, Peju's slides in contradistinction to both mine and JR's were wonderful in having people in the streets uh, honoring the objects that were returned, uh, having the vitality of contemporary uh, responses to um, conventional and honored objects. And uh, we need to follow that too. Thank you, Benetta and JR. Um, I think I'd like to open up the discussion to public um, questions and comments at this point. So please um, go ahead and submit them to the Q&A box if you have some. We do have some, um, two in particular to begin with. Um, one question for um, Dr. Jules Rosette. Uh, in the context of Sarah Bartman, who was mentioned by your colleague, um, how do you work against the perceptions of quote unquote, cutting up African art and people in this context? How is unmixing holistic making whole? So um, getting in back into the ethics of there are multiple questions there, but let me say one, uh, we interviewed Serge Tone, who was the director of the Africa section of the Musée de l'Homme at the time that Sarah Bartman's remains were returned, actually, and he said he started crying and he couldn't even watch it and went down to his office and closed the door. That's what he said in his direct interview to us. Um, but what we noted is it took from um, 1995 Nelson Mandela's request, which already had been building up actually since the 1970s. So if we tra track the Bartman thing, it had built up for a long time in terms of rem remains being returned. Um, but it finally got done in 2002. And um, though she had been examined, dissected, the majority of the remains were returned. Now, there were other remains from Spain and other countries. The, the guy that is called um, the, the, the Bushman man and from Spain and Portugal, where actually there were only fragments of bones returned. So some of this stuff has been pretty, uh, pretty awful. And even in the move uh, situation that's going on now, as we speak, it's not resolved. It's going on in Philadelphia, in the United States, with the University of Pennsylvania. These remains are, are partial because there was a burnout there and they're not sure they can identify the three children. So um, some of this stuff is, is very sad. Um, that said, I, I, um, some of the stuff falls on the shoulders of museums that were involved in these transitions. Other stuff, I'm not sure that it falls 100% on the museum community as a whole, but the museum community through, let's say, the Council of Museum Anthropology or the the organization of museums can make some statements about these things and start to develop a direction. Individual museums, what I wanted to show in my nodal analysis are all very different and some have di very different levels of responsibility. Uh, that said, pointing to um, Peju's talk, you know, if we go to node one collectors, there are a lot of node one collectors who have Benin plaques. I just visited one. And, um, you know, what I'm trying to encourage them is to say, okay, what are these Benin plaques and do you think you might return them? So, um, you know, th these things cut across levels of collectors, museums. They got across auction houses. 
Um, I think that what we can do and what I, I see for the new Stanley Museum, which is going to be from no point two seven five to no point five, um, is to be a leader um, in this process of looking at uh, these various cases. And maybe you guys might even open up a, a subdivision of your museum, which will kind of look at uh, before we're looking and look at these cases of collaboration, return, and so on, and you'd be one of the first university museums to do that. So I would very much encourage that. I appreciate the suggestion, Benetta. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question from uh, the same uh, audience member, Tracy Morris, for Dr. Peju. Um, she asks, I wonder if you think there's a difference in the way that African diaspora private collections, especially home collections, are reparative or reinforce the issues of contextualization you've raised well as an artist and curator. Um, and it looks like we've unfortunately lost Peju, which is really unfortunate. I know that she mentioned a major thunderstorm in Lagos that may affect her internet connectivity. And I do not see her screen in our meeting any longer. Um, so I will unfortunately need to uh, forward that question to page you after the event. She did warn me that this might happen. Um, I'm thankful that she was able to join us for as long as she did from Lagos, but that, um, that was a factor and a warning I had to keep in mind. So I will forward that question to her. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us this evening to answer that directly. <clears throat> um, if there's any other questions from the public, we do have a little time. If not, um, we are nearing a, a two hour point um, in, in our session tonight. So if I don't see any more questions, um, I think we can go ahead and and wrap up the session tonight. Um, so thank you, JR, did you wanna say something? Yeah, if we, I, I, it, only if we have time, I could also respond very uh, briefly, kind of build off the, the question from, from Tracy about um, cutting in relation to unmixing. Sure, sure. That, Great. oh, I think that, I mean, museums historically have a, have a history of, the, these discussions aren't, Easy, as Benetta said, that's a that's a difficult one. Museums have a history of cutting in all sorts of varieties, right? From the horrendous practice of cutting physical specimens to cutting the names of creators off of objects that were collected, and we we don't know who those creators were, to cutting something out of its cultural context and bringing it into sterile environments. So I think that that history is there. Um, and I'll say one thing about so the digital gives us is the ability to make copies and cut these copies without damaging the the object itself that we can cut through the digital object and still leave the object itself um in its um in its original state um which allows us to do exactly what Sieber asked to go different places in between but return to the object when we cut the physical objects we can no longer return to that physical thing um that said I think we there need to be limits on them. And on one, these objects in a digital environment will be cut up anyway. People will take photos of them, they will remix them, they will cut them out with Photoshop, they will put them together in different pictures in, in different. So those that those practices are gonna happen. And so I think part of what museums need to do is be aware of this and kind of discuss, contextualize that cutting. So it isn't simply remixed and becomes part of this just looks cool and we can mix it with that. But when the, when so to kind of contextualize the, the elements so that when they are used or somebody does cut something or something in the unmixing where we take out elements, it's to contextualize the object so that we gain a deeper, deeper understanding of that and contextualize that, that violence that of, of what cutting the original object does imply so that we that, that can be understood by by the audience members. I mean, I, I think it, I mean it would be even wonderful to have a kind of an exhibit that looks at that reflexively, kind of the the relationship between the digital cut up and the reality of cut up and how that has different influence the uh, cutting up, cutting up real objects and how those have influenced, you know, um, museum development and museum present presentations. Uh, but so I guess my my simple 
a short answer is to say that the cutting will happen of digital objects. Luckily, if you're cutting digital objects, you're not cutting the original, but then the, it's really partially on the museum, on museums to contextualize what those practices mean so that um, if, when cuts are made, those cuts are understood as significant as both potentially damaging and potentially uh, um, a, a learning moment. Thank you, JR. You know, I'd, I'd like to just um, complement that by recognizing the way in which um, these sort of morphological unmixed analyses of objects have led to new ways of understanding the objects outside conventional means of compartmentalizing African art objects specific to ethnic groups, for example. Um, the whole one tribe, one style model does not um, comport to this sort of intervention of unmixing that nevertheless belongs to this history of stylistic analysis that Franz Ulbrichs developed in the 40s and Ella Safin developed in the 70s and so on. Um, this very careful, close looking isolation of formal characteristics of an object forces us to reconsider what it is and what it means. And um, so I think it's important to, to recognize that even as these ethical questions come up about this process of dissection um, that are, are just as important to, to keep in mind. Um, I did get a message from Peju that she lost her um, internet connection. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm connected to her via WhatsApp and I will go ahead and cut and paste the question I received and paste it into WhatsApp and see if she's able to respond. Um, but um, thank you everyone so much for, for joining us this evening. And if, if Paige is able to respond here shortly, I will relay the information. But I think um, in spite of our best attempt in this digital age of, as Vanetta mentioned, you know, relying on these sort of digital sharing collaborations, um, we're, we're not quite there yet in terms of making everything perfectly smooth. So, um, I think rather than um, attempting to go through a third platform, um, I think this is probably a, a good point to uh, call it an evening. Um, thank you so much, Benetta and JR. And thank you, Corey. Um, I really enjoyed your presentations and I, I really appreciate the way it forces us to think about our work in museums and our engagements with African art. And to our audiences, I hope you can keep these scholars in mind as you encounter our African collection at the Stanley Museum next fall when we reopen in a new building. And I hope many of, many of you, if not all of you, can join us in person in September of 2022. Thank you very much. Um, thank and thanks for a wonderful you. series of events. Extend our thank you to Peju as well, and to the panelists on the earlier events as well. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Corey. Oh, thank you. you um, and, and I just want to uh, send a shout out again to Pasala for the amazing support that has enabled this this series this fall. Um, thanks again and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, Corey. Corey, Bye. thanks, everyone.